Apple has made some huge updates to the iPad Pro. And I've got two review units in front of me right now. They're both the 13 inch models with basically top of the line specs. So this is sort of the best use case. And one of them has the nano texture display. So I wanna go through all of the new features, just play with them in real time with you. This isn't a scripted video. Usually I have more notes, but I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. So you're just gonna hang out with me in real time and we're gonna check out this new hardware. Let's start with what Apple probably considers to be the biggest change. And that's just the thinner size as you can see. This is one of those things that's kind of hard to tell until you've actually picked one up. So I do strongly recommend going to an Apple store just to get a sense of it yourself. And I do have one of the older iPad Pro models so we can do a direct side-by-side -side comparison here. I mean, when you just kind of stare at the differences, it... like let me know on YouTube, on your screen, how obvious is the difference of this thickness? It's not until you're holding them and then you can definitely feel that weight difference. I think if you're the kind of person that has always found a large iPad to be too heavy, it's not so much lighter that will change that, but it does change the equation of whether you're gonna throw it in your backpack or not. Like, it will be comfortable to hold for a little bit longer than before. A change that kind of slid under the radar in the announcement is that the ultra wide lens has now been removed from the new one. I don't mind this at all. I'd probably buy an iPad even without a camera on it because it's just not what I use it for. But if that was important to you, just be aware. By far, one of the biggest updates is it now has a new display. This is one of the big reasons you might choose an iPad Pro over an iPad Air. And it's now using OLED technology, but even more than that, it's using double OLED, what Apple is calling tandem OLED. So it's basically two displays overlaid inside of there so it can double the brightness. Now, I know the iPad Pro is very expensive. Like I do think this is a quite pro product because it's the price of a laptop if you start specking it up. But the thing is, I work in video production and I'm used to spending an insane amount of money on monitors. <clears throat> Like over here, this small HD with a wireless transmitter built in, this cost about as much <laughs> as one of these iPads a few years ago. Now it is not as good of a display as what's in the new iPad Pro. So this really is the future of where display tech is going. It has better color reproduction, better contrast ratios, and maybe most importantly, better brightness levels. And I don't know how much it's gonna translate in the video. Let's turn them all up to 100. And let's just look at the same screen on both of them. Is this? Coming through in video, I mean, it's very clearly brighter on the new iPad Pro. This 1000 nits of brightness doesn't really matter indoors, but when you're outside, it will make a significant difference. It is so helpful being able to see what you're doing when you're in bright sunshine. And that's why a lot of video monitors are so expensive. Let's let a video play for a minute. So if you're the kind of person that uses your iPad primarily as a personal TV, which a lot of people do, it's not a huge creation device for me, even though I do creative production for a living, usually I'm consuming video on it. And if you care about the quality, I mean, you can absolutely see the superior image quality coming out of this, especially especially the colors, maybe even more than the brightness. But the HDR also does pop with the 1600 nits of brightness. That seems to be the new standard that Apple's going for with all their devices. I cannot wait to see the screen brightness trickle down to iPhones, especially. Using an iPhone outside, seeing it more clearly, that's gonna be a big deal. Now, speaking of seeing things outside, let's swap out the old iPad Pro for a, another one of the new ones. So now on the left, we're looking at one of the most expensive models you can buy because this also has the nano texture display. To really see what's going on, we're gonna to need to add some additional light. So I'm sure by now you know what a reflection looks like on an Apple display. It just looks like a pinpoint of light and that's what the sun is if you're trying to read outside. So check out the nano texture. It really just soaks that up. Like I sort of, I can't really make it show up in the same way. It just diffuses that light all across the screen. Whereas like it is very much a clear single source on the standard glass. I've heard people have discussions about this. Like it's not clearly superior to have this because it also does slightly reduce the contrast ratio from some angles. The blacks don't always feel quite as rich when you're using the nano texture but I massively prefer it, especially from my perspective right now, like check out the reflection of that key light and how it just disappears <laughs> on the nano texture. Um, this works, this is amazing. I also like the physical texture of it a little bit more. This is a good time to introduce uh, the Apple Pencil Pro. We'll talk about this throughout, but the feeling of the regular glass is you know, what you're used to. It's very smooth. An Apple Pencil on the new display feels a lot more like paper. Like it's got that slight texture and resistance 
that's just missing from the traditional glass. Now, this isn't the first nano texture display we've seen from Apple. When it was available on the studio display or XDR display, they were very specific about only cleaning it with the expensive Apple cloth because otherwise it'll be damaged. This is an iPad. You need to be able to touch it and, you know, mark it up with a pencil. So I've had people wondering, you know, is it gonna hold up so far? I've actually found it's like taking fingerprints less than the typical glass. It does come with a fancy Apple cleaning cloth, which does the job, but I don't think it has to be this special one. From what I can tell, this is just holding up fine. It is a new chemical process. So they're not doing the same thing as on the studio display. I don't think durability is gonna be a big issue. Just don't apply any chemical cleaners to it. That's a bigger risk than touching it with your finger. I'd think of this as like either a very luxury or a very professional version of the build. You have to buy the one terabyte model to even have the option to upgrade to nano texture. So it's not for everyone, but it's really nice. I'll just, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're considering going all out, in fact, it's so much better. That's going to be the primary one I show you from now on because it doesn't reflect my key light. So now that I've paired it and I'm using it, let's take a look at the new Apple Pencil Pro. It feels and looks identical, except for the badge on the bottom. You wouldn't necessarily know which one you're using. And I've always loved the feeling of the Apple Pencil, like the way it fidgets. It's just, it's nicely weighted. To try out some of these new features, let's use the Freeform app because it's available on all iPads. Uh, the first thing I loved is the squeeze feels so real. So if you don't know what's going on, there's a little haptic engine inside here so that it is giving me instant feedback. Obviously you, you can't tell when I'm just holding this in front of you, but I feel like the actual pencil is sinking into my fingers each time I squeeze. And you can see it's bringing up a menu here. And as I hover over top, it's kind of showing me what's gonna happen, kind of which tool I'm gonna to end up selecting. Let's just do a little bit of scribbling. You're not gonna get anything nicer out of me today. But the squeeze menu also brings up different undo options, which tick with that same haptic feedback. This is one of those things that, you know, you're gonna to wanna to see an actual artist do something with, which I am not. But again, I'm gonna to have to kind of point you to the Apple Store to feel that feedback, because squeezing it is really interesting. And now I'm in Procreate, which I should spend more time in. This feels so cool. There's this like, <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just getting excited. There's just this like feeling with the brush of like momentum and connection that, um, I don't know, everybody that's already used Procreate probably knows about. Moving into the Notes app, I can showcase another new feature of the Apple Pencil Pro, and that is the idea of a barrel roll. So let me just make this calligraphy brush a little bit bigger so you can see the preview is rotating with me. So it has a sense of the direction that the pen is facing. So pretend for a second that I knew what I was doing. I could do lines that have like thoughtful strokes going in different directions and twisting works with it. So other people are gonna figure this out much better than me. Let's move on to something I understand better than the Apple Pencil. So Apple has also made an update to the Magic Keyboard. Very similar textures and materials to the previous one, except on the inside. This does feel nicer, it feels closer to an actual MacBook. Your iPad Pro is gonna mount in the same way, <clears throat> unless you accidentally grab the old iPad Pro and then it doesn't mount at all. The new iPad Pro mounts in using magnets. It aligns itself more or less. I really feel like I need it to be using my iPad for much. It both gives it a way to prop it up, which now also the hinge is in a slightly better place because of the lighter weight of the iPad. And Apple has also been able to fit a function row. So there's a few more keys on the keyboard now, as well as haptic feedback inside of the trackpad. So it's not bumping and clicking quite as much as the old one used to. Apple has also finally moved the face ID and cameras to the horizontal layout of the iPad, which makes a lot of sense. Although it's still kind of strange that the actual Apple logo isn't in that orientation, even though that seems to be the new default. But that just means like, well, you're mounted like this, it will always unlock. You won't be covering it with your hand, which used to happen on the previous ones. So now we're at this weird place with pricing where if you spec up an iPad Pro, get all the accessories, it starts costing as much as a lot of MacBooks. MacBook Pros even. So you really actually need to be putting these features to use, be in a professional situation, or it's just your primary computer. We're still in a place where most people are probably better served by the iPad Air. Think of the Pro as a preview of all the technology that's coming in the future, those better screens. We got the M4 processor first, but I think, again, most people don't need to spec it all the way up. Now, before we're finished, we have to talk about the M4, which is 
so exciting. It's such a big part of this. And I honestly haven't done anything on this that has been able to push it to requiring the new speeds that the M4 provides. A really quick backstory if you haven't been following is that M3 MacBooks were announced just recently in the fall, which came pretty early. Like it was a surprise how fast it came. So this is really fast that we are already at M4. Basically, TSMC, who manufactures the chips for Apple, found a bit of a dead end with the M3, and that doesn't mean that it's a bad chip. They just decided to go in a different direction for the rest of all the future chips, and so that effectively means they wanted to get over to the M4 process as quickly as possible. After seeing the Geekbench results, I can totally see why. This looks like the M4 is going to have some significant performance increases over the M3, so that's eventually gonna trickle down to the entire lineup, including iPhones, all the way up to MacBook Pro Maxes. So I'm really excited to see what that does because in the last generation, we had a huge bump in the GPUs. And now in this generation, we're seeing it in the CPUs as well as the AI, which it's weird, Apple's saying AI now, they used to never say that. But the neural engines in these have also made some big strides forward. So this M4 chip is the first step in Apple really taking a big swing at AI, but we haven't seen the whole story yet because WWDC is still around the corner. And I think that's gonna kind of complete this story arc of like what is going on with these chips and what can they really do? So stay tuned. There's gonna be a lot of Apple news coming out soon. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the next video.